Hello, my name is Dr. Jordan. Uh, welcome to Math 10, uh, College Algebra Online. Um, just a couple things before we get started. Um, I want to let everybody know that the textbook is free. Uh, you can just go to OpenStacks.com um, and look for the College Algebra book. Uh, there's only one College Algebra book on OpenStacks.com. Uh, you can download for free. If I could spell download. Um, or you can buy uh, a hard copy uh, for around $40, approximately $40. There might be some shipping or something like that. Um, you can also find it, um, if, if you don't want to shop with OpenStax, you can also find it on Amazon. I think it's $46 or something like that. Um, so that's the textbook we're going to be using for this course. Um, we are going to skip chapter one. Uh, chapter one is the prerequisites. Uh, the prerequisite section. Uh, you may review it on your own. Or not. Um, I, I recommend at least browsing the prerequisites to make sure that you're in the right class. If you, you know, read chapter one and you're like, oh, I don't know how to do any of this stuff, then maybe uh, the class before this, the intermediate algebra might be a better course for you. But again, I'm not going to hold you to that. You know, some people might think they don't know it, but then as soon as I start teaching, they go, oh, yeah, I remember that from high school or from some other class you might have had at COD. Um, so my lessons are going to start with chapter two. I'm obviously not going to sit here and read the book to you on the internet. I'm just doing this the first time to get you going. So um, we're going to start today with chapter two. Okay. Um, that's about it for the introduction. Um, let's go ahead and get started do some math. So the first section is 2.1, rectangular coordinates. Uh, the rectangular coordinate system is where our entire course will exist. Um, practically every section, every lesson will have some relationship to the rectangular coordinate system. Uh, this is an example or one example of the rectangular coordinate system. Um, I will give you a little bit more information about that in just a few minutes. Um, we're going to start with some ancient mathematics. might have heard of this one before, the Pythagorean Theorem. Uh, historical note, uh, the Pythagorean Theorem was is accredited to Pythagoras of Samos. Uh, Samos is an, an island in the Mediterranean uh, near Greece. Um, his dates were 570 to 4. 95. You can do the math on that. So that would be BC, or sometimes in the modern notation it's referred to as BCE. Uh, this is the, the modern notation, it means before the common era. Okay, um, you might have heard of the Pythagorean theorem before. The Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared in a right triangle. A right triangle is a triangle that has a 90 degree, which is also known as right angle. Call that a right angle. 
Now, the most important thing about a right triangle is C is called the hypotenuse. C must be the diagonal or the hypotenuse of the triangle. It really doesn't matter which ones you call A and B. Sometimes I call this one A and I call this one B. Sometimes I call this one B A and this one B. It really doesn't matter. So A and B can be interchanged. Okay. Um, but if you accidentally put C in the wrong place, you will always get the wrong answer. So C must be the hypotenuse. Also known as the diagonal of the, if you think of this as a, a box, you know, you have the diagonal going across it. Uh, a and B are called legs. A and B called the legs. Um, we're going to do some mathematics in the abstract, just on the whiteboard, before we start um, doing the graphing problems um, in which this section gets its title from. So let's call this example one. Uh, use the Pythagorean theorem. To find the missing lengths or sides. All right, so I don't know, let's, uh, let's call this I. Um, to be very clear, we often put the square in the corner to indicate that this is a right triangle. Okay. I'll probably do a couple of these just to get the ball rolling here. Uh, so what do we got? We have um, A and B. Doesn't really matter which one you call A and which one you call B. If you want to be consistent, you can always call the bottom B because it's easy to remember that, and then A would be the other side. Just make sure that C is the hypotenuse. Uh, so you have A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I like to rewrite it C squared equals A squared plus B squared. It's just a little technique that I use, and you'll see that throughout this lesson, I often write my formula this way. Often we memorize it A, B, C, but I like to write it C, A, B, or C, B, A, or something like that. All right, so we're looking for C. So we have uh, A squared, so that'll be 3 squared. And then we got 4 squared. I'm using parentheses to set a good standard that you'll hear me say a lot in this class. It's always better to have them and then get rid of them than it is to not have them and then go, oh, I wish I would have had them. You know, So 3 squared is 3 times 3, which is 9. Uh, 4 squared is 16. So C squared is 25. And now we're going to take the square root of both sides something that's in the prerequisite section, uh, but I'll be doing this a lot in this class. The square root cancels with the square, and C is the square root of 25. Use a calculator if necessary, but I don't think it's necessary. You can do this one. 5 times 5 is 25. That's one you know by heart, yeah? So C is five. All right. Now just be careful. Sometimes people will say C is square root of five or C is five squared or something like that. This is my little mental math bubble. If you're new to my lecture style, I, I often put mental math in a bubble and I imagine I know that you know your times tables. So five times five is 25. That's why we call it the square root. 
Okay. I always start with an easy one. Let's try another one. You know, it doesn't matter which way you write, you draw the triangle. Oftentimes we draw the triangle like that. So find the missing side. This time the missing side is A. Yeah. So I've got C. C is 9. A is going to be our unknown. Uh, you could also call it X. I often do that, but I'm in this example, I'm using the traditional A, B, C variables. And 6 would then be our B. Um, I guess I can probably get rid of this. All right. So watch this. Watch what I do. I keep the Pythagorean theorem in my head as A, B, C, but then I look at what I'm actually missing, and then I rewrite my formula So I subtract the b squared from both sides. And now my formula is going to automatically be set up to solve for the side that I'm missing. OK. Again, the right angle's here. Sometimes we omit it. I know my camera's skewing the, I swear that's 90 degrees. Um, close enough, anyway. All right, so let's plug everybody in. We've got A squared is what we're solving for. Uh, what do we got? C squared, so that's 9 squared. And then B squared is 6 squared. So A squared is 81 minus 36. Can you do 81 minus 36 in your head? Sure you can. 81 minus 6 is 75, and then 75 minus 30 is 45. If you're not sure, I would much rather have you do it on a calculator and get the right answer to double check. All right, so now we're going to do the square root step. We're going to take the square root of both sides. Canceling off the square root, and we're going to get A is the square root of 45. Huh. What number times itself equals 45? There isn't one, yeah? 7 times 7 is 49, you know? 6 times 6 is 36. Yeah, th those dots are multiplication dots. Yeah. But you never exactly get 45. So this problem has two forms of the answer. One is the exact answer. Exact means just leaving it in the form of a square root. Yeah, that is the exact answer. Somebody said, tell me exactly what it is. Well, it is exactly the square root of 45. Uh, later in the, ch in the semester, we will learn some techniques to simplify that. This is the first lesson. I'm just going to allow you to leave your answer like that. Or you can use a calculator to approximate. Uh, the symbol for approximate is a wavy equal sign. It, it comes from when people go, eh, it's about this. Um, and for that, you're going to need your calculator. Uh, most of the smartphone calculators, if you turn them this way, in fact, you guys probably already know that. Um, I learned this from my kids. You turn it this way, you're going to get a scientific calculator. I don't want to screw up my... Uh, 
focus here. So I'm going to go 45, and then I'm going to hit the square root button. The square root button sometimes has a 2 right here to indicate square root. Uh, oftentimes when we write it on paper, we write it in the formula, uh, we don't put the little 2 there, but on the calculator it'll say that. Um, so I want you to do four decimals. So we'll do A is approximately 6.7082. Okay. I want you to do four decimal places in this course. This is for the entire course, unless told otherwise. Yeah, so some problems might say one decimal place. Some problems might say two decimal places. Rarely ever do you see three. It's usually one, two, or four. I, don't ask me why, but three is hardly ever asked for. Okay. So that's your introduction to the Pythagorean theorem. I will come back to the Pythagorean theorem later in this lesson. Let's go ahead and put that to rest for now. We're going to talk about distance. So before we can talk about distance, we need to talk about what's called a line segment. So distance is also known as the length of a line segment. length of a line segment. So I'm going to call this point A, and I'm going to call this B, and this is now called the line segment AB. So we call this line segment AB. Uh, some people do this. They'll say AB, and they'll put a little hat on top of it like that. I'm not really going to do that all too much um, unless I really want to prove a point there. I want to make an emphasis there. I might do that. So these are different notations for a line segment, A, B. Okay. In order to find the length of a line segment, we need to draw a triangle. That gives us a third point called C. Okay. I also need a coordinate system, right? I need to know where are these points. All right. So we actually have three line segments. Let me put that over here where you can see it. We actually have three line segments. We have AB, we have AC, and we have BC. All right. um, the order really doesn't matter, but I usually put them in alphabetical order. That's the normal way to write out the uh, line segments, A, B, A, C, and B, C. So let's do a, an actual problem with some numbers here. So our goal is to find the length of this line segment, A, B. That's our goal. Let me give you some specific numbers. Uh, it's very difficult to solve a problem in complete abstraction here because you can't really see or, or understand the location of these points. So we're going to put, put some numbers to this now. Let's call this example two. Given A is the point negative 5 and 2, 
And B is the point. Uh, B will be the point. Uh, what should we make it? How about um, 7 and negative 3? Find the coordinates of the point C and find the length of the line segment AB. So let's use the grid. There's my ordinate. There's my abscissa. Let's plot the point A, negative 5, and 2. So there's the point A. Okay. We got the point B. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And negative three. Negative three over here. That's the point B. I have two objectives. One is to find the coordinates of the point C. So where is the point C? You need to draw a triangle. This is the point C. Now, the cool thing about the point C is even though I'm telling you to find it, there's really nothing to do. It essentially finds itself. You take the x coordinate of the A, and you take the y coordinate of the B, and you put those together, and the coordinate C would be negative 5 and negative 3. And remember, we often omit the equal sign and just say C, parentheses, negative 5, negative 3. Now, if you really want to put the equal sign in your notes, you can say C is equal to that. You can say that as well. But it's understood when you put the letter next to the coordinates that we are saying that is the name of that coordinate, or that is the location of that point C. So that part's pretty easy, yeah, pretty straightforward. It's just more of just reading off the graph, making sure you understand the, the concept from earlier. Now we really got to get into it. Find the length of the line segment AB. Okay, so to find the length of the line segment AB, I'm just going to draw a rough picture like this. That's really rough. Let me try a little bit better. And we're going to learn a little bit of classical geometry. Okay. This point here was C. So this side is called side C. So I have point C. And then across is side C. Okay. This is point A. Yeah. Another name for a point is a vertex. But in this particular presentation, I'm just using the word point. And then opposite of A is what's called side A. Now we try to use uppercase and lowercase to distinguish between them. And then this one over here is called point B, capital B. So across here would be side B. 
lowercase b. I don't know, that looked like a six, so I'm gonna write it like that. There we go, side b. Okay. Now, in order to solve, we need to find the length of side A, side B, and side C. Um, I'm just going to copy these down so I don't lose them. So we have A is negative 5, 2. We have B is 7, negative 3. And we got this point C that we found, negative 5, negative 3. All right. So let's go through them all. All right. Line segment A, uh, B. Well, actually, I, I changed my mind. I want to do uh, B, C first. I'm going to do this one first, BC. Yeah, so side A is the length of side A. Yeah, how long is A? From point C all the way to point B, how far is that? Okay, if it helps, you can look at your grid. So how far is it along side A? So I want to go from point B to point C, negative 5 to 7. There are several ways to do this. One way is to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So the length of side A is 12 units. All right, by counting. It's probably the most common way to do it, especially if the numbers are relatively small. Okay. But if the numbers are big, or if they go off of the grid, or if they're maybe decimals or fractions, which at some point we're going to have to deal with that, we're going to need a better way to do it. Okay. So I'm going to put away the grid, and I'm going to do it by using a formula. The length of side A yeah, is the absolute value of the difference between the x coordinates of B and C. So it's negative 5 minus 7, absolute value of negative 12, which is also equal to 12. We use absolute value to ensure that the answer is positive. Okay, so when you say the, the distance is negative 12 or the length is negative 12, that doesn't really make much sense. So you'd say the length is the absolute value of negative 12, which is actually 12. Notice it's the same thing, right? So if you solve the problem by counting or you solve the problem by using absolute value, you will get the same answer. Okay, so we're going to say side A. We normally omit the word side and we just say A and that's equal to 12. A is equal to 12. Let's do the same thing over here, yeah, for side B. So looking back over here at side B, yeah. So line segment uh, AC is side B. Yeah. And we can do it by counting. Let's just come over here to our grid and count. We're down here at negative 3. We're going all the way to 2. We can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units. Yeah, 5 units from A to C. Just counting 
vertically there. All right. Um, I'm going to erase this and redraw it in a second. All right, so let's go ahead and do AC by using the absolute value formula. B is equal to the absolute value. Remember, AC, A, so 2 and negative 3. 2 minus negative 3, absolute value. 2 plus 3. Absolute value of 5. In this case, it's already positive, so the absolute value is still just 5. So B is equal to 5. Notice that's exactly the same answer, check, that we got by counting. Now, if you're new to this or you're new to this style of lecture, I often will tell you an easy way and a hard way. Yeah, or a more complicated way. It's tempting for you just to say, well, I'm just going to always do it the easy way. And that's fine. I mean, you can, you'll get away with that for a while. But eventually, that ship's going to sail. <laughs> the easy way is not really going to be possible. And so if you've trained yourself to always do it the easy way, then when you eventually need to do it the complicated way, you don't know how to do it because you've just always done it the easy way. So. Uh, it's a little bit of a, you know, a double-edged sword. I want you to learn it the easy way because, you know, I want you to understand that this is a doable thing. Um, but I also want you to know the more complicated way. All right, so let's go ahead and get back to our original problem. So we were trying to find the length of AB. Yeah. That's our question mark. We know that this side is five units. That's B, lowercase b. And we know that this side is... 12 units, lowercase c, and our goal is to find the length of this side. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is lowercase a. Sorry. Oops. A, b, and c. Okay. This is technically a lowercase c. Uh, that, has that bothered you since elementary school that lowercase c and capital C are the same letter? It's like kind of like O is like that as well. All right, so we, we're trying to find out what is C. Okay. So we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem says that in a right triangle, now again, we're not going to have a complete course in college geometry, but we are going to learn a lot about geometry in the process of doing uh, algebra. A right triangle is a triangle in which one of the degrees is 90. 90 degrees is also called right. We call that a right angle, okay? And that's about all you need to know for this course. So in a right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse the hypotenuse is C is always equal to the sum of the squares of the other two legs. A and B. All right. Also known as C squared equals A squared plus B squared. In a right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is always equal to the sum the sum is addition of the squares of the other two legs, A and B. Okay. So that'll do it, right? We know that A is 12. 
We know that B is 5. So we know that C squared is 144 plus 25. So C squared is 169. Now we need to do a little mental math. If C squared is 169, 13 squared is 169. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that, mental math. Well, we're going to break out the calculator in a second, but you know that 13 times 13 is 169. So if C squared is 169, then that means C is 13. It's the square root of 169, which equals 13. And so that is the length of the line segment AB. And that'll do it. Probably could have done that a little faster. Um, but since this is the beginning of chapter one, I want to set the tempo. Um, and I just want you to understand the way we break things down. Okay. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have a recipe? I mean, think about what a recipe does, right? You know, suppose you, you make some wonderful dish, you know, in your kitchen or something, and you just... You know, you're, you're sitting there just adding in ingredients, you know, and you've got your flour and your salt and your butter and all these other things, your spices and stuff, and it comes out really, really good, right? Or perhaps really, really bad, but hopefully really, really good. And you want to preserve that so that next time you do it, you don't have to do all of this work all over again. Wouldn't it be nice to have a recipe so that we can repeat the process? That's essentially what a recipe is for, right? So that you don't have to do the same thing over and over and over again. We, we would have some sort of a formula. Yeah, that's what a recipe is. So in my class, when I say recipe, I really mean a formula, right? A set of instructions, letters, numbers, and symbols that tell you how to reproduce the result. So here it is. This is what I've been leading up to this entire time. The distance formula. Given any two points, Find the length of the line segment AB. I have to abbreviate the word segment, so line seg abbreviation AB. Okay. Now, right away, we're going to notice something. We have our x coordinate and our y coordinate. That's supposed to be a comma. And we have our other x and our other y coordinate. So in order to distinguish between a and b, we're going to use subscripts. So a is x1 and y1, and b is x2 and y2. Now, if you're not familiar with subscripts or if you don't use them in your other classes, uh, subscripts are not exponents. They're not powers. They're not division symbols. They're, they're nothing to do with a mathematical operation. They have only to do with keeping the A and the B separate in my picture. So when I draw my picture, okay, I'm going to say x1 and y1 
and there's a comma in there. I know it gets kind of messy with the comma in there, but so this is the point A, and then I'm going to distinguish between A and B by putting the point B over here and calling it X2, Y2, calling that the point B. All right. So the subscripts are just to distinguish who came first and who came second. All right. And our goal is to find the length of the line segment AB. That's our goal. Now, we already did this a minute ago with specific numbers. In this particular presentation, I'm doing this for any pair of points, um, A and B. All right, so I'm not going to put down specific numbers on here. Okay, and so here is the formula. If you want to find the distance from A to B, you first need to find C. C is always the first coordinate from A and the second coordinate from B. So notice C is x1, y2. So it takes the second coordinate from B and the first coordinate from A. That's always going to be point C. All right. Then we find the links of the sides. Uh, let's just use lowercase letters for A. So A will be the absolute value of x2 minus x1. B will be the absolute value of y2 minus y1. Let me draw those in here x2, x1, you take the absolute value and you subtract x1 and y, x2 and y, and x2 and x1, and that gives you a. And then for b, for side b, you're going to subtract y1 and y2, and then the absolute values ensure positive results. Sometimes you don't need the absolute value. If the number already comes out positive, we'll get more into that in a minute. But it's better to have them than not to have them. Okay. And so we have c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. Yeah, that's the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. And now we're going to replace everybody with the new um, notation using x's and y's. This is where the uh, teaching at home thing really um, starts to be a hassle. I have to erase every few minutes. Okay, so <laughs> bear with me here. So now we have c squared is absolute value of x2 minus x1 squared using this. Yeah, that's the value of a. And then we have b squared. b squared is the absolute value of y2 minus y1 squared. And then we're going to take the square root of both sides. And we're going to call this D. Yeah. D for distance. Um, in your homework or on a test, if you still call it C, there is no penalty for that. As long as you know that C is D, I don't, I don't care what you call it, right? As long as you get the, the correct distance. It just sounds weird to say the distance is C. Yeah, it's just a little bit more 
you know, practical to say that the distance is D, all right? Uh, what's happening is this is actually C. We're just replacing it with a different letter, okay? Also on the right-hand side, you may remove the absolute value bars, or you can keep them. It's up to you. You will get the same answer either way. Yeah. Uh, because we are squaring, we may remove the absolute value bars. It's automatically going to be positive. Uh, because of the squaring. And there you go. So this is what we call the distance formula. This is the special sauce. This is that secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices. Okay, this is the thing you want to preserve and keep it in a safe place so that you can do this whenever you want. Okay. Are you going to love this now? I'm, I'm, you might have wished that, you know, 30 minutes ago or whatever, I just would have thrown this formula on the board and, and let you go with it, right? And that, you know, if you want, just fast forward to this point and start from here, okay? When you're doing your homework, I'm going to be asking you for the distance, and now you've got the recipe. Yeah, so you can just use the recipe card and figure it out. Cool thing about this is now you don't even really have to draw the picture. Find the length of AB. Again, I don't have to say line segment. I mean, that implies that it's a line segment. So A is going to be, uh, what should we do? Let's, let's not make this one too complicated. Let's do a negative three and um, six. And let's do B is a negative seven and uh, two. No picture required. Yeah, once you have the recipe, it almost seems like you know you already have the answer in your head. All you have to do is piece it all together. So A, I'm calling that X1 and Y1. It's the subscripts. B, I'm calling X2 and Y2. It turns out that it doesn't matter which one you call X1, Y1, and which one you call X2, Y2, but it might as well make it easy. A, 1, <laughs> B, 2. It's an easy way to never get them mixed up. Okay, so just do it that way. You'll be fine. All right, the distance is the square root. X2 minus X1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Plug everybody in. So x2, x2 is negative 7. All right, that's x2. x1, x1 is negative 3. Now be careful. I already know what's going to happen on the test. If you're writing too quickly or if you're trying to be tricky and just do it all in your mind, you might accidentally go negative 7, negative 3, and get the wrong answer. So be careful. That's a double negative right there. All right, for the Ys, let's use another color. I don't know if the color is showing up very well, but for the Ys, we've got these guys. So we've got y2, y2 is 2 minus 6. Okay. So now we've got negative 7 plus 3 squared. Yeah, that's this double negative here. Yeah, negative, negative three. Yeah, so that's positive three. You got a little chapter one basic math review. Uh, and then we have two minus six, which is two plus negative six. Yeah. So that's going to be negative four squared 
And oh, another negative four squared. That's a coincidence that they both came out to be negative four. That probably won't ever happen again. Oh, and again, I've run out of space, so I'm going to move over here. So now I've got 16 plus 16, which is equal to the square root of 32. And we're going to need a calculator. We're going to need a calculator. I didn't bring a calculator with me. What to do, what to do, what to do. Run! I'm back. Uh, I wasn't expecting to get a, a decimal for this example. So um, the answer is the square root of 32. This is what we call the exact distance. I'm not sure if you can see that. Let's try that again. Exact distance. Square root of 32. So there are two answers. There's the exact. And then there's the approximate distance. To do the approximate distance, um, now normally in a classroom setting, I probably wouldn't be using the phone, but with the camera, my calculator doesn't pick up very well, but the phone picks up nicely, and I'm sure most of you have phones. So turn your iPhone or whichever type of phone you have that way to bring up the scientific menu. And then you're going to do 32, and you're going to hit the square root button. And that gives us 5.65685424949. Okay. Now, I do not want you typing in all of these decimals. Most of the time, I want you to round to four decimal places. unless told otherwise. All right, so in other words, for the entire course, if I don't say it, it means four decimal places. That is the standard automatic expectation. Some problems will give you a different instruction. Well, if it gives you a different instruction, do whatever it says. But in this problem, I'm going to do four decimal places. So you're going to look at the fifth decimal place. Yeah, so look at the fifth place. That's called the dictator. Yeah. If the dictator is bigger than five, five or bigger, then go up. So if it is five or greater, round uh, the eight to a nine. That's called rounding up. Yeah. So we're going to round it up to nine. If um, it's less than five, uh, th uh, keep the eight and eight. So we're looking at that eight right there. You're probably all screaming at the screen right now going, come on, Dr. J, just get it over with. So this is definitely greater than five. It is five. So five counts as five or greater. So we're going to round this up to a nine. So it's going to be 5.6569. So the last digit is a nine. All right, there you go.
That's the distance formula. I know you just want to see one more, don't you? Sometimes we omit the line segment notation. We omit the capital A and the capital B. Um, I'm, you've probably noticed over these last few problems that I don't really use the capital letters. The capital letters are kind of a throwback to old school classical geometry. So we're now going to omit them. I'm just going to say find the distance. So the capital letters are often used in the early stages to sort of get the ball rolling, to get the idea of the geometric shape of the object, um, but you do not need the capital letters. It's really the distance formula that you need. So you have your x1, your y1, your x2, your y2, and let's just get after it and find the answer, okay? This is probably the way you would do it on your own without all the bells and whistles. So you've got x2, x2 is 4, x1 is 2, 4 minus 2 squared. All right. If the coordinates are positive, you don't really need to be as careful. I mean, I always want you to be careful, but you can let off your seatbelt for a second. Okay. y2 is 5, y1 is negative 10. Oh, be careful with negatives. That's actually going to be a positive. So you're going to have 2 squared. 4 minus 2 is 2 squared. 5 plus 10. That's 15. Yeah. I like to do these little bubbles where I just think about what's happening here. This becomes 5 plus 10. This is Dr. Jordan's mind bubble here. And then I don't have to waste a whole line on that. I can just do the calculation in my head. Okay. So now I've got the square root of 4 plus 225. If you're not sure about that, then do it like this. 15 squared. And you can confirm that it is, in fact, 225. I think you probably know your times tables. Uh, most humans can do them up to 12, up to 12 times 12. Some people can go a few extra. I like you to know up to 15, right, in your head. Multiplying the number by itself up to 15. Once it gets past 15, then typically I, I would use a calculator probably. Uh, to save space, I'm moving horizontally. This is the square root of 229. This is the exact value. The approximate value, 229, hit the square root button. It's right underneath the x squared. It's 15.1327. That's your approximation. OK, um, I think probably had enough. Uh, the best thing you can do now is to review these examples um, and practice this on your own. Uh, there is an assignment uh, in 2.1 with uh, questions involving the distance formula. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to do today is the midpoint formula. We have to go back to drawing pictures. The midpoint formula is also known as finding the center. The 
center is called M, yeah, the midpoint. I don't want to call it C. <laughs> the C is actually over here on the triangle, right? So again, it's center, but it's the center of the line segment. So we're using the M for the middle. The middle of the line segment. This formula is a lot more straightforward than the other formulas. A lot more straightforward. We're still going to draw the triangle. Okay. We have the coordinates of this point. We have x2, y2, that's B. Uh, we have x1, y1. That's A. Remember I said we can omit the capital letters now? We don't really need the capital letters anymore. Okay. I mean, if you want them, you can have them, but they're not really going to be used. And so this point is X2 and Y1. All right. It has the same X coordinate as the second point, and it has the same Y coordinate as the first point. So now I want to find the middle. The middle here is the average. The average is y2 plus y1 divided by 2. That is the average of the y's. I'm just going to put that in a little bubble. I want to do the same thing down here on the x's. I want to find the average of the x's. So the average of the x's is x2 plus x1 divided by 2. And so the midpoint is the coordinates of the averages or the average of the coordinates. So M is equal to the average of X comma the average of Y. I'm abbreviating average A-V-E. I think it's obvious why I'm doing that. My board's just not big enough to write all that out. So the final formula is the midpoint is x2 plus x1 divided by 2, comma, y2 plus y1 divided by 2. This is what you call the midpoint formula. Those twos are kind of hard to see there. That's a two. All right, much easier than the distance formula. You might wonder, why didn't you do the distance formula for, I mean, why didn't you do this one after? But you know, well, it is the way it is. This is the way it's presented in the textbook. This is the way it's done in the homework. And so this is the way I'm doing it in the lecture as well. Okay. Example five. Find the midpoint of AB uh, Here's my formula here Okay, so find the midpoint, find the middle of this line segment. So I've got x1, y1, x2, y2. I want to find m. Again, sometimes we omit the equal sign, but I, it kind of looks funny when you do that in this problem, so I like to keep it, you know. It tells me that m is equal to that. Um, turns out, just for future reference, you don't need any of the capital letters. 
So I could do this problem without the letter A, the letter B, or the letter M. It can all be done um, just using arithmetic and algebra. All right, so I've got um, x2 plus x1 divided by 2, y2 plus y1 also divided by 2. Make sure you're adding and dividing. So x2 is negative 5 plus 3 divided by 2. Those are my x's. And then my y's, 3 plus negative 8 divided by 2. So that's going to be negative 2 halves and negative 5 halves. You may use decimals or fractions, but you must simplify as much as possible. So negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1. Negative 5 divided by 2 is negative 2.5. You could have also left it as negative 5 over 2. So I would also accept this. So you do have two. Um, potentially correct ways to write the answer. Um, typically, people prefer the decimal because when you see negative 2.5, your brain goes, oh, I know what that is, right? Negative 2.5. Uh, when some people see negative 5 over 2, their brain kind of like has an unresolved childhood issue, and you go, oh, man, I don't, know, I don't know what that means anymore, and you get a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm comfortable with both. Uh, my goal as your teacher is to help you become comfortable with both of these answers. And either one. You know, sometimes write it this way, sometimes write it that way. Uh, if you haven't had my class before, I call this a tomato. And I call this a tomato. Tomato, tomato. Okay, so that's the midpoint formula. Uh, some people call these the midpoint formulas because there's actually two of them. There's one formula for Y and there's another formula for X. Uh, this is buy one, get one free. So if you know the formula for X, then you also know the formula for Y. It's the same exact formula for each coordinate. Try not to blend them together. Very common mistake is grabbing one X and then accidentally grabbing a Y over here and mixing the two formulas together. You don't want to do that. X with X, Y with Y, and that's how you find the midpoint. It's a midpoint problem where I give you the midpoint, but I don't tell you the other point in the example. So suppose that I give you the midpoint. So suppose that the midpoint of the line segment AB is 2 and negative 5. If A is the point negative 3 and 6, what are the coordinates of B? So um, when you get a problem like this, um, the first thing I would recommend doing is drawing a very rough sketch just to make sure that you understand what it is asking. I give this problem every year in this course, and oftentimes um, if you've only memorized the midpoint formula, what you'll end up doing is you'll take all the numbers in the problem, you'll shove them into the midpoint formula, you'll think you got the right answer, but that's not at all what the question was asking. So let's just read it carefully, draw a picture, and make sure that we know what it is we're actually looking for. So what does it say? It says that A, let's start with A, so we're going to kind of ignore this for a minute. We're going to start with A, is negative 3, 6. So over here, negative 3 and 6. So that's A, OK? This is actually M. Because it says the midpoint is this, so m is equal to 2 and negative 5. So there's my m, okay? I'm regretting my picture a little bit. 
We want to know where is B. Um, and again, my screen's not quite big enough. The actual point would be off the bottom of the screen here, but just make sure that you understand what it is that you're trying to find, okay? We already know M, M is given. We already know A. The question is asking, where is B, yeah? So we know that B will be down here somewhere in the region of quadrant four, somewhere down here. In the last example, I mentioned that the midpoint formula is actually two formulas, right? You have a formula for x, and you have a formula for y. So let's do the x-coordinate first. Yeah. Remember, we call that the abscissa, yeah? the x-coordinate. x2 plus x1 divided by 2. That's my x-coordinate. That should be equal to 2, because 2 is the x-coordinate of m. So that's the x value of the midpoint. Now I know my x1 is negative 3. My x1 is negative 3. So I have x2 plus negative 3 divided by 2 is equal to 2. I need to solve for x2. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So x2 is the unknown value. So we have two unknowns, x2 and y2. I'm only going to solve one formula at a time. So first, I'm going to solve for x2 and figure out what that is. So I've got x2 plus negative 3 divided by 2 is equal to 2. We're going to multiply both sides by 2. We're going to get x2 plus negative 3 is equal to 4. I need to erase this. OK. And then I'm going to add positive 3 to both sides. And that tells me that x2 is equal to 7. Now, I don't know about you, but does that seem reasonable? I'm looking for a point down here in quadrant 4. So x better be positive. Yeah. And 7 seems like a reasonable value. It is the correct value for x2. Okay, and now we're going to do the same thing for the y-coordinate. I'll do that over here. So for the y-coordinate, it's the same formula. y2 plus y1 divided by 2 is equal to negative 5. Negative 5 is the y value of the midpoint. Yeah. So you're going to take the y value of the midpoint. Okay. Oh, and I had to move my thing over. But remember, we have y1 is over here. y1 is 6. So in this formula, I can replace y1 with 6. So now I have, I know I'll have to draw the picture over again later. Now I have uh, y2. Well, y2 is what we're looking for. That's our unknown value. So y2 is our question mark. I always like to. Just remind myself, what am I actually trying to find here? And you're trying to find y2. Plus 6, because we know that uh, this value is 6. That's our y1. And then we know it's equal to negative 5, because negative 5 is the y value of the midpoint. OK. To get rid of the 2, you're going to multiply both sides by 2. That's going to give you negative 10. 
And then you're going to subtract six from both sides. And you're gonna get y2 is negative 16. The question was asking, what are the coordinates of B? Well, the coordinates are uh, x2 and y2, 7 and negative 16. So your answer is the coordinates of B are 7 and negative 16. Uh, sometimes we omit the equal sign and we just say B is 7 and negative 16. Or you say B, 7, negative 16. These are all equivalent responses. They all mean the same thing. In fact, the only part that I'm going to grade is this part. I'm only going to grade what the actual coordinates are. I'm not going to grade the equal sign or even the capital letter B. I mean, as long as you're solving the right thing, I'm not really going to worry about that. Okay. I mean, I'm picky, but I'm not that picky. Uh, one thing you can do if this was a test or a quiz, on a test or a quiz, you can check. I mean, if it's not a test or a quiz, if you're just doing your homework, you'll find out in two seconds whether you're right or not. Um, but it only takes a second to check if this was a test or a quiz. Um, I'm actually going to turn it this way. And you'll see why in a minute. Um, let's see. So we'll go. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it like that. Let's see. How about like this? So I've got two negative five. That's my M. I've got negative three and six. Negative three, one, two, three, four, five, six. So right there, that's A. And you just want to check that this point, seven, negative 16, is reasonable. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It looks pretty good. And negative 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's still off my board. Um, I'm just going to call that negative 16. And I mean, checking is really just asking yourself, would you believe it? You know, if somebody said, does this point M look like it's in the middle of A and B? It, it's reasonable. It is definitely reasonable. Check, check, check. If this point accidentally ended up over here or up here or, or perhaps too close to M, you could go back into your algebraic you know, formula and you could make sure that maybe, or you could re-do um, that part of the problem to make the answer reasonable. Yeah. Or you could not check and just get it wrong. It's up to you. I mean, you might get it right. Who knows? But if you check, it'll help you sleep at night. Um, and you'll definitely get a higher grade. I've found that over the course of my career, students that check their answer are nine times out of 10 more likely to, to have the correct answer. So, Okay, um, I know that was a lot, um, but this is uh, the introduction to chapter two. Uh, 2.1 is done. See you tomorrow on the internet. Dr. Jordan, signing out. Okay, moving on uh, to example seven. Uh, this one's a little bit like example six um, in that I'm giving you part of the point, but I'm not giving you the entire coordinate. Um, in this one, I'm giving you the distance to be exactly 13 units. So you, like in the last example, I gave you the midpoint. In this example, I'm giving you the distance, all right? Um, now, I'm not asking for both x and y in this problem. Uh, some problems I will ask for just x. Other problems I might ask for just y. Uh, but it turns out I can't really ask for both um, in this uh, lesson. So um, let's go ahead and, and just kind of get an idea of what's going on. You could just jump right in and try to solve it. 
I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I've mentioned this before. You read first, then you draw. Sometimes you draw while you're reading, then you translate, then you solve. So it's a really bad idea in my class to try to read the question and jump right to solving it. Typically, you will not get the right answer. Um, and then if you want to spend a little extra time, especially on a quiz or a test or something, I would always encourage you to check. All right, um, I've got two different versions of my board here. Um, this one actually works a little better because the grid is a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm going to go, um, actually, I'm going to go this way. So I've got the distance. Um, just want to make sure I leave enough room for everybody. The only downside to using this board is I have to draw the X and Y axes every time. So I got my X, I've got my Y. Now let's just talk about what this means. X comma eight, that's supposed to be a comma. That means I know the Y value is eight. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know the y value is eight, but I don't know the x value. X is an unknown value. So that means I'm somewhere along this line. Yeah, I know the y value is eight, but I don't know the x value. So I'm somewhere along this line. I might even be off the board. I don't know. If I have to move over, I will. And then I have another point, 6, negative 4. So let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. So this is my other point, 6, negative 4 here. All right. And I want the distance to be exactly 13 units. So notice that I know I can't be directly up here because that distance would only be 12 units. Yeah, you could just count. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this would only be 12 units. I want the distance to be 13. So I know I have to be a little bit off to the left in order for this distance to be 13. Yeah, the distance is 13. Um, there's actually two answers, values. There's another one over here, it's like a triangle, in which this distance is also 13. So there are two possibilities for what x can be. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for these two values. All right. So that's reading and drawing. Now we're going to translate. Um, some people can solve the problem totally by using the diagram. Uh, that's how Pythagoras would have done it. Believe it or not, the algebra that I did at the beginning of this lesson with the Pythagorean theorem, that's not even how they did it You know, 2,000 years ago. They did it by drawing in the sand and actually figuring it out with sticks and stones and things like that. Yeah, We've got a much more sophisticated method now. I'm just going to put this off to the side, and we'll come back to it in a minute. We'll come back to the drawing when I'm done, when I get to my checking. All right, I want to make sure my answer makes sense. All right, so what do we got? We got um, distance is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. It turns out that the order really doesn't matter wh which one you call x1 and which one you call y1, things like that. So I'm actually going to do this a little bit different. I'm going to call this one x2. I know last time I did it backwards. It doesn't matter. I want you to know that you can choose your direction. However, once you choose, now you've made your bed, OK? I call this, you make your bed, you lie in it, all right? If that's x2, well, then this must be x1. 
All right, you don't get to make two choices. You get to make one choice. And once you've made that choice, the other number must follow the choice that you just made. Okay. Also, if that's x2, well, then this must be y2. And then now I've made my bed, so this must be y1. Oh, oh, and I already know D as well. D is 13, so that's going to be 13. Uh, you'll see why I made the choice that I did in a second. X2, I'm now just calling X. It makes it a lot easier. I don't have to use the subscripts anymore. Uh, X1 is 6. Don't forget the squares. A lot of people forget the square root, and they forget the squares. Uh, what else? Y2. Y2 is 8. And Y1 is negative 4. Be careful. Very common mistake is to just go 8 minus 4. That screws the whole thing up and you just wasted your time. And I'm not giving you that time back. It's gone. especially if it's a quiz or a test, which is timed. You don't want to be wasting a bunch of time like that. Um, and then don't forget your exponents as well. So I've got x minus, oh, sorry, it's 13. I almost squared the 13. I will do that in a minute. x minus 6 squared plus 8 plus 4 squared. So 13 equals x minus 6 squared plus uh, 12 squared. That's where I wish I had a bigger board. x minus 6 squared plus 144. Um, you should be able to multiply in your head up to about 150 in your head. Maybe a few people can go higher than that. Maybe you can go 200 in your head. head. You shouldn't have to use a calculator unless the numbers get, you know, into the thousands and or the many, many hundreds, something like that. Okay. You don't cheat yourself out of your own education. All right. You never know what you can do until you do it. Um, I am running out of space, um, so I have to come back to the top. So if my board kept going, I would keep working down, but unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. Uh, I try to just copy the whole thing over again just to make sure I didn't lose anybody on the way. All right, and now you need to get rid of the square root. So you're going to square both sides. And that's going to get rid of this square root. Make sure you don't get rid of this square. All right, that square is last. You're going to do that last. So 13 squared. If you have to use a calculator, do it. If not, if you're really good at your times is, at times tables, 13 times 13 is 169. OK. Um, I'm trying to solve this for x. So I'm going to subtract 144 from both sides. Nice. You should smile if that happens. 25 is a number that you all know. You probably know it from way back at the beginning of the lesson. It's 5 squared. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides. That's what's so nice about this. I'm going to kill the square roots. Yeah, the square root of 25 is 5. Here's another way to write it. If you haven't done this in a while, you can write it as 5 squared. And then 25 becomes 5. All right. I mentioned this in my very first example. Don't put 5 squared here. Put 5. All right. On the right side, you're canceling. You have x minus 6. Okay. Now remember, 
there are two possibilities. Remember my picture? Yeah. So when you see this plus or minus, that really just means right or left. <laughs> so the solution that's on the left, that's my minus. And the solution that's on my right, that's my plus. That's what the plus or minus means. It means that you have eh, one or the other, plus or minus, yeah. mas or menos. Um, I'm going to flip this around a little bit. I think it's a little easier if you write it this way. X minus 6 equals 5 or X minus 6 equals negative 5. Split it up. Don't try to solve these all bundled together. You'll get one of them right and the other one wrong if you do that. And you don't want to get 50% credit. You want to get 100% credit. So actually make two different equations, plus or minus. Here's the plus or minus. I don't know if you can see that. Um, at this point, you're done. Uh, you can do this with mental math. You're going to add 6. So you get x is 11. Or on this one, you're going to add 6. And you're going to get x is 1. And there you go. Let's check our answer. So these are our two solutions for x. Um, we often uh, use subscripts now, so we'll call this x1, and we'll call this x2. I like x1 to be less than x2. So when you give me the answers, give me this one first, and give me this one second. All right, and you know, I really probably shouldn't be that picky, but since you're submitting your problems online, I have to be that picky. If we were back in the classroom and you turned this in on paper, honestly, I wouldn't care what order you gave me the answer in. But anyway, the computer wants them in a particular order. I want them in that same order. All right, so let's go ahead and check our answer. All right. Now, there are two ways to check. All right, I've mentioned this before, and if I haven't, then I'm mentioning it now. One way is just a mental check. All right. Does your answer make sense? Does it make sense? All right, so if this was one then this would be the point 1 comma 8. Does that seem reasonable that that distance is 13? Okay. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it seems reasonable to me. Yeah. I would believe it if this distance, I should put the 13 right on the line here. I don't, I don't, I mean, the length of this line is 13. Yeah. I can tell you what, if the line was much longer than that or much shorter than that, I would know that it's wrong. So sometimes when you do a visual check, it's easier to find the falsehood or the lie than it is to find the truth. So, so far I say, yeah, it looks reasonable. I know it's, it's, it's not entirely wrong. It looks reasonable. Okay. And then the other one was um, unfortunately off my board. So I'm going to just kind of fake it here. I'm going to go over here, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I know, I, I try not to do that. And then this point right here would be 11, 8. All right, does that seem reasonable that this distance would also be 13? Yeah, sure. I mean, look. It's pretty good, and I know you're seeing a stretched out version because my camera kind of stretches it, but that, that's pretty good. You know, if I were to take out a ruler and measure it, it, it's pretty close to 13. It might even be exactly 13. Okay, so if this is your homework, I would just type in the answers. X1 is the smaller X, so that's 1. 
and x2 is the larger x, which is 11. Remember, I'm not asking for y. I'm only asking for x in this problem. OK. If you want to do a hard check, call this an algebraic check, Nobody ever wants to do this, but I would recommend doing this on a quiz or a test if you want to make sure that you're getting it right. Come back to me. There we go. All right, so how would you do an algebra test? You check one at a time. Just check one at a time. So I've got distance equals the square root of, uh, what do I got? Um, so what was my uh, x2? I erased it a while ago. It was a 6 and negative 4. That's my x2, y2. And then my x1, my y1 was, um, yeah, this is kind of confusing, isn't it? My y1 was 8. So I'm just doing a check here. It's, it's going to be right, but I'm going to go 6 minus 1 squared plus uh, negative 4 minus 8 squared. So that's 5 squared, negative 12 squared. I know I'm doing it backwards, but I'm, again, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, 5 squared is 25, negative 12 squared is a positive 144. What am I hoping to get? 13. Check. I got exactly 13. If I don't get 13, then I know I did something wrong. Uh, you can check this on your own. I'll call that DIY. Do it yourself. Don't worry, it works. <laughs> if you kind of want to fake it, you can just go in and replace the 1 with an 11, and you'll see that you get exactly the same answer. Okay. So I showed you how to do it with x, solving for x. What you're going to do is solve it for x or possibly solve it for y. It really makes no difference. It's the same process either way. Okay, and then I want to wrap up this uh, section. Um, with some word problems, some applications. And that was about 20 years ago uh, when I first started teaching. This is my 25th year teaching. Um, there was a big push against word problems. It, it, it wasn't really against them. It was more to reformulate word problems. And so all we did was rename them. We, we never really took word problems out of the curriculum. We just kind of renamed them, and now they're called applications. Yeah, so you might see nowhere in the book will we use the term word problems. So word problems is an old-fashioned way of scaring people out of doing math. All right, so let's try this. Uh, two people uh, leave from the same point. Uh, person A travels 20 miles north. Person B travels 18 miles east. How far apart are they now? So this is going to just be an application of the distance formula or of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, if there's one thing that I hope you got out of this lesson, it's that Pythagoras, Pythagorean theorem is exactly the same as the distance formula. It's just dressed up in a different form. And hopefully you know your four directions, north, south, north and south, All right. east and west. 
So that is the Cartesian coordinate system. Look, you got your, you got your abscissa, you got your ordinate, and you're good to go. Okay, so person A travels 20 miles north, so I'm going up 20. So we're assuming we start here. We always start at the origin, so we're going 20 miles north, 20 miles north. Okay. And so this is person A. If you like, the coordinates are 0, 20 but I'm just gonna say 20, all right? Person B travels 18 miles east. Let me get rid of the word start. So now we're over here at 18. And the question is asking, how far apart are they now? So you have two ways to do this. One way is use the distance formula, okay? Or you could use the Pythagorean theorem. It really doesn't matter, all right? I'm gonna go ahead and use the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, look at, I've got A, B, C, it's nice. It's all set up for that. So C squared is 20 squared plus 18 squared, 20 squared is 400. I have to admit, in all my years, I've never memorized 18 squared. It's never bothered to memorize it. Maybe you did, but I didn't. 324, so some of you are screaming at your computer right now, 324, you should have known that, right? 324, so C squared, is 724, 724, I'm assuming miles, yeah. Uh, I can't do the square root of 724 in my head. Maybe you can, I don't know, I, probably not. So I'm using my button. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody out there that could have done that in their head. It's 26.9072 uh, miles. Okay. And then just round this answer as instructed. So if I say uh, one uh, decimal place, that's called tenth. I would do 26.9. Yeah. If I was asked for hundredth, that's two decimal places, that would be 26.91, etc., 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 as instructed. If you're not sure, then read the directions again, or you could always just do four decimal places to be safe. Although you should read the instructions. Um, I know there's um, many times where you think you know or you think you have the right answer, and then you go, oh, I just didn't read it carefully, and that's a very common mistake. I've done it myself. Okay, so that's the navigation problem. Uh, you could have also done it using the D equals, the distance equals the square root, big fancy formula, and you would have gotten the same result either way. I encourage you to try problems both ways. If you forget one way, maybe the other way will save you. You, know, you wanna have a fork and a spoon, you know? Um, example nine. Um, suppose um, that you're locked out of the house and um, you need a ladder to reach a window that is 14 feet above the ground. Uh, but there's a bush in 
the way. The house. So there's a bush in front of the house. The base of the ladder. I know the, the problem is going to take up the whole page just to write it down. Uh, must be uh, three feet away uh, from, the, from the house, from the building. What is the minimum uh, length that the ladder must be to reach the window? Now I'm assuming you have to reach the bottom of the window. So you know you got a house. There's the house. You've got a window. All right, there's a bush down here. The bush is three feet. So you know the base down here is three feet. And you know the bottom of the window is 14 feet. Here, I'll make the bush green. So there's the bush. So you have to be three feet from the bottom. And then you've got a ladder like this. And to be safe, you have to at least reach to the bottom of the window. All right. So yeah, I don't want you jumping an extra foot or something like that. All right. So again, Pythagorean theorem, C, C, or the hypotenuse, or D if you're using the distance formula. And then these are going to be your A and your B. So I have A is 14, B is 3, and C is unknown. All right, remember how I like to do the Pythagorean theorem? C squared is A squared plus B squared. 14 squared is 196. 3 squared is 9. So that'll be 205. Now again, that's not your answer. You do not need a 205 foot ladder. You need a, so 205 square root uh, 14.3178 feet. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should go read the question again. It doesn't really tell me what to round to, so I could probably leave it like that. Um, but, you know, when this is a ladder, you typically round up. Yeah, so I would say 14.3 uh, uh, feet. 14 wouldn't be enough, right? I know that five or greater rule or whatever, but still, if you threw away this 0 0.3, your ladder is not going to quite reach. So it's always better to go a little bit bigger than a little bit smaller. Can you handle one more? All right, been hanging in there. Um, Last example, uh, televisions are measured by the length of the diagonal. Yeah, so when you go to your Best Buy or something like that, and you, they say, you know, 60 inch television or 32 inch television or whatever, they measure the TV by the length of the diagonal. That's to mislead you. <laughs> they say, oh, it's a 55 inch TV, but you know, it's not really 55 inches. Um, again, this is the symbol for inches. Just a quotation mark, inches. Uh, for feet, it's just one mark for feet. Uh, so we have a 23 inch tall 
and 36 inch wide. So what is the size of this television? In other words, what size would they say it was on the box? Uh, you don't need to use the inches symbols when you're solving it. Um, you could if you wanted to, um, but it's not necessary. All right, make sure you know that what it is, it's inches. There are some questions that ask you specifically, is this inches, is this miles, whatever. So the diagonal, you can call it C, or you can call it D, it's up to you. I know we've done a lot of these today, so you're at, at this point, Dr. J, I don't need another one, but I just like to end here with this example. I mean, if you feel like you already have it, you already have it, good to go. Uh, 36 squared plus 23 squared. Remember, it doesn't matter what order you put these in. Um, parentheses are, you know, nice touch, but not necessarily required. Um, but, you know, if you don't have them and then it causes you to get a, a wrong answer, I'll, you know what I'm going to say on Zoom. I'm going to say, well, you should have used parentheses if you, if you come to my Zoom hours. Uh, these are getting into the thousands here, so I can't do these in my head. 36 squared is 1,296. 23 squared is 529. I'm gonna add those together. 529 plus 1,296 is uh, 1,825, 1,825. And so C is the square root of 1825. I know I didn't put a square root on both sides. If you really want to, you can. You know, go like that and cancel those guys out, you know, like that if you want. And that's just for show anyway. All right, so I got 1825. I'm going to hit the square root button. And this is a... 42.72, uh, let me read it really carefully. One decimal place. That's also known as the 10th. So we're gonna go 42.7 inches. They probably at the store would just call it a 42 inch TV or maybe a 43 inch TV or something like that. Um, I've bought a lot of TVs in my in my life. I've never seen a 42.7 inch TV, but um, there it is. That's what it would be for this particular problem. Okay, uh, that'll do it for the first lesson, Math 10. Um, this is Dr. J signing out. Until next time, I'll see you on the internet.